I'm Mark Allen, and I'm the host of That Word Chat. Welcome. We have uh, Amon Shea and Peter Sokolowski, two lexicographers. I'll tell you a little bit about them. Peter started out studying French literature. Amon started out, he says, as a gondolier and uh, a street musician and a furniture mover. Um, so we'll definitely talk about how one gets into the field of lexicography. Um, maybe not the way you would think. Um, Ammon's the author of Reading the OED, Bad English, and the world's uh, only social history of the telephone book. Uh, <laughs> another an exciting subject there. Peter is editor at large for Merriam-Webster. Uh, in that role, he's an active blogger and speaker. He serves as a pronouncer for spelling bees worldwide. And uh, he spins jazz for uh, regularly for New England Public Radio. So we'll talk about jazz a little bit too. Um, and I see Ammon, and I don't see Peter yet. We may have to wait a little bit for, oh, there's Peter. Uh, hello, Peter, welcome, Ammon, welcome. Hello, thank you. Yeah, and the best way to, to do this is we'll, we'll, I have you both on speaker view, so when you speak, you will jump to the, to the front, and that's um, the way I recommend everybody do it. But uh, sometimes you just want to avoid what's on stage and turn your opera glasses to what's going on in the audience, and that's fine too. That's why I have gallery view. So keep in mind that if you're on camera, people might be looking at you at any moment. <laughs> so, um, so I know that uh, lexicography can be an isolating business. I've heard stories of the uh, the, the quiet office um, at Merriam-Webster. Is this, uh, so is this like no big deal being quarantined? Well, quarantine is different for everybody. I really liked office life. I really enjoyed the Merriam-Webster office. It is very quiet, famously quiet. Uh, but I also have to say there's, uh, there's sometimes a hum of activity on the floor that I really, I actually like. And so I miss seeing my colleagues. Uh, I see them on Slack. I, I see them on Zoom occasionally. Um, as it happens, it's the kind of job you can do pretty well from home. And, uh, and I think the work is going on really well. But I do miss the office life and I don't know when we'll get back to it. I think I was the last person inside the building um, and I conducted a tour uh, for, uh, on Zoom for uh, a college course of the, uh, the Merriam-Webster office. And uh, after we did it, they said, oh, we should have recorded that. <laughs> um, because I don't think anyone has stepped in the building since then in March. Hmm. Yeah. How about, and Alan, are you in, uh, in Massachusetts also? Or where are you located? No, uh, I, I'm typically in New York City, but uh, now decamped for a slightly upstate New York near Massachusetts. Um, near Hillsdale. Um, I, my family has a small place in the woods and uh, quarantining is kind of my natural environment. I haven't worked in the office ever. So I've been working from home for the past five years at Miriam. And um, it's temperamentally and otherwise, um, I think, well suited to the, the work that I'm doing. So um, it feels much the same. Mm -hmm. So I, and I should ask because I, um, I, you know, the one the one thing is a, is a poor job an interviewer does is when he knows all the answers and forgets to ask the questions. And in this case, um, I've heard the stories, but I mentioned the the quiet office. Uh, Peter, maybe you could tell us a little bit about what the situation was in the office at Merriam Webster. Uh, you mean in in normal times? <laughs> in, in, well, normal times and in in the past. I know that I know that you you took us on a tour uh, of the building, which was great, and we spoke. I mean, I I spoke in hushed tones, I think, but it wasn't like it was. Uh, um, you know, we were too uh, too quiet, but uh, it used to be even quieter. I understand. Yeah, I mean, it was. It, uh, the editor, there's two floors. There's the, it, the, it looks like an academic uh, library. It's a brick, red brick building. Um, it was built for us in 1940. Um, and uh, the first floor, the ground floor is the business floor. So there's marketing and sales and phone sales and support and uh, administration. 
And then on the second floor is the editorial floor. That was the silent place. That was, <laughs> that was supposed to be quiet. And uh, when there were many people there, I started, there were 45 editors working all day, every day on the dictionary in one room, essentially. Um, it, was, it was very quiet. Um, and so they kind of had the hush of a library and you would whisper uh, if you were chatting with someone for the most part. Um, and that was just to avoid disturbing others. Um, John Morris, the president of Merriam-Webster for many years, he used to say, doing this kind of work is kind of like taking a test. Um, and so distracting someone is, is, is actually kind of stopping the whole process if you're in the middle of uh, thinking through a definition or something. Um, it could be that you're proofreading, it could be that you're copy editing, it could be that you're defining, it could be that you're researching. There's all kinds of different tasks, but all of them, are probably better done without distraction. So the idea was um, minimize the distraction. Over time, what happened was, first of all, we became more electronic with the process and the research. And second of all, we, we have fewer staff and that's just part of the natural business cycle uh, that we all know about um, after, especially after the Great Recession. But Merriam-Webster survived and uh, now we are about 25 working all all day every day on the dictionary um, on that floor but many of us working from home or remotely so it actually sometimes feels a little bit a little bit uh, uh, vacant um, and, uh, and that has allowed I think a little bit more of a relaxed feeling if that makes sense mm -hmm. and that just that's just kind of a natural uh, yeah. a natural uh, kind of uh, evolution right yeah okay. Peter, Peter's giving the uh, the official explanation for why it's mm -hmm. so quiet there I think the, the unofficial explanation is that when they built the building they um, they imbued the mortar between the bricks with a disapproving gaze of Noah Webster so it kind of <laughs> it's everywhere in the building is this feeling that Noah is looking at you and he's somehow disappointed when you make noise. <laughs> that's but the feeling I have got there that if you say something somebody yeah. unseen and unspoken but is very disapproving uh -huh. It is true that it used to be that the uh, that communicating between editors wasn't was supposed to be written down like on a on a little slip of paper like this, yeah. and you would write the initials of the person you're writing to, and then you'd write your little note and you put it in your outbox. And t twice in the morning and twice in the afternoon, the typist came by, picked up your slips, and would deliver them. So you would have conversations that way. So it was kind of a proto email. Email obviously <laughs> ultimately killed that system. Yeah, it, you have, I suppose you have the instant messages now, too. Yeah. And so, so you can actually, you can goof off at work. You can actually have a conversation sure. uh, about something entirely inappropriate or un, uh, nothing to do with what you're actually working on at the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. I, it's good to know that it's, uh, you know, for people who are thinking of going into the field of lexicography. So, uh, so being a gondolier is, uh, perhaps a good segue into the uh, into the field. There's no there's no program, right? Or is there? Is there a program anywhere to be a lexicographer? There is. There are a couple of programs now. Um, I have not yet met any lexicographers who have come through them, but the programs exist. Um, you can study Indiana University has got some excellent, excellent people teaching there. And also um, in, in the UK, I think at Oxford, one can get a doctorate in lexicography. Huh. Um, but most lexicographers do seem to come through um, alternate paths. Um, and uh, I, I would not suggest that gondoliering or furniture moving or playing music is, is one of the traditional ones, but there, there really is no traditional path to lexicography. And where was this, uh, where did this gondolier work? Uh, San Diego. <laughs> it, was, it was not in Venice itself. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. I found myself in San Diego from 20 odd years ago. And, um, and there was a fellow there who had um, been a Hollywood set builder. And um, he decided he wanted to build some gondolas and row them. And I just happened to cross them. And um, I ended up uh, rowing gondolas for nine mm -hmm. months or so. And um, wow. Enormously enjoyable. Okay. And when did you start reading dictionaries? Um, long, long time ago. I would say um, in the uh, 1990s. And um, it was, and what will surprise no one, not uh, the, the most lucrative undertaking. Um, <laughs> it didn't work out that well. I had written several earlier books about obscure words. But um, it was really that after I had been a, a furniture mover for a number of years, um, I came to the not unreasonable conclusion, I think, that anything would be 
preferable or easier to carrying pianos up fifth floor walk-ups in New York City. And so reading a dictionary uh -huh. not seemed to make sense. It, it, it felt like it was a real kind of quality of life improvement. And um, that turned out to be true, I would say. Yeah, it turned out to be what? That turned out to be true. Um, true. Okay. It's easier to read dictionaries and 16th century texts than it is to carry pianos. <laughs> I suppose that's true. So, uh, so how did reading the OED come about? Um, um, how did it come about? Well, and as I said, I, I, I had previously read a number of dictionaries. I had read Webster's Third and Webster's Second International and some editions of Bailey's uh -huh. um, century dictionaries and just mainly for my own enjoyment. And, um, and then I, I needed to do something else for work. And so I had the idea that I would read the Oxford English Dictionary because I really wanted to. And uh, my previous publisher, which was um, Perigee, an editor I had worked for previously, worked at Perigee Books, and she agreed that they would uh, publish this. And so I stopped moving furniture and I started reading uh, the Oxford English Dictionary. And that took me through the next year. And then after that, um, I kind of started doing piecework for various lexicographic concerns. Um, hmm. I was a reader for the Oxford English Dictionary for a while, um, primarily looking for antedatings of words, which is citation gathering, um, which is some other editorial work for various dictionaries. And then about five years ago, um, that led me to full-time employment at Merriam-Webster. Uh, but I, I have to point out, um, I, I am not what I would call a lexicographer because they don't let me near the defining um, I do mm. not actually define words. And, and some people who like to quibble about such things would say that it, in, inherent in the job of lexicographer is the de defining of words. And I do not do that. And I think it's better for all concerned that they don't let me do that. Um, <laughs> primarily write about usage and the history of usage. And um, I do a fair amount of, of, of chronological work. I, I do antedating of words, um, but I don't actually define them. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so let's talk about antedating because this is something that will maybe make some people's eyes glaze over and it's uh, something I, I have a lot of fun with. And I, and I do have a criticism or, or a, uh, an issue or a comment about Merriam-Webster and antedating is I can go to the OED and I can look up when I want to see the original, the first use of a word. Uh, it's listed there. It's, it gives me many examples. Whereas Merriam-Webster says, first known use, 1848. And then I'm left, I'm wa wanting more. What was the first known use of this word? Okay, well, I'm so glad that you, mm -hmm. you've decided to make a slightly argumentative stance because Good. it allows me to <laughs> Um, first of all, everything you said is untrue on some very basic. Good, level. excellent. There never yeah. is of first known use. There is, to the best of our ability, the, early, the best of our knowledge, this is our, our, the earliest we found so far. Mm -hmm. um, the Oxford English Dictionary doesn't give you the first use of the word. They give you the first use that they found. And they're changing those first uses constantly. Um, mm -hmm. And they will almost never say, this is the point at which a word was coined. There are a few exceptions to this, Horace Walpole, we're fairly certain that he coined serendipity. And it's only because he wrote a letter to his friend in which he writes about the word serendipity, which I have just coined, and he explains how he coined it from the three princes of serendib, um, and he explains what it means. It's very, very helpful, but nobody really ever does that. We're pretty sure Richard Dawkins coined meme in The Selfish Gene in 1976. People like to think that Shakespeare coined X thousands of words, but in reality, he coined almost none of them. Um, but this is, we, we think that he does because he's given the earliest known use of these words. Um, so it's, I like to think of the earliest known use as a kind of rough guide to when, you know, we can say we're fairly certain that this word was in some use at this point, but we're not even positive, you know. In some cases, it was in use for a little bit and then it dies out and then it comes back. It just gives you an idea of what the research has found to that point. Right. Now, as to why the Oxford English Dictionary um, uh, gives you so much more, well, one reason is because they're, um, they're funded. Um, they're not strictly a commercial enterprise. They're funded by the University of Oxford. Um, mm -hmm. And that allows them to have 21,730 pages in which to display all these great citations. Merriam-Webster is a little more streamlined and they just don't have the room to actually put the citations in. They would love to do this, um, but there's just not quite enough room to put all that in there. Is that, would you agree mm -hmm. with that, Peter? 
I, I of course, but I, I would also say that it, it, there's a there is a mission that is different. I think the fundamental mission, uh, and it's it's an important distinction. It's very subtle for most people, but we're among word lovers, here, word professionals here. Mm -hmm. um, that the Oxford English Dictionary is a diachronic dictionary. It's a dictionary that records a thousand years of English, and its function is historical. Um, the the uh, the set phrases. It's a dictionary made on historical principles, and that's what that means. Um, uh, the Webster tradition from Noah Webster on has always been a synchronic tradition. So the, the current active vocabulary of American English has been our mission. Uh, and so a, as such, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not taking as part of our mission to give you the whole thousand year history of a word, but rather to give a, a snapshot of how that word is being used today or has been recently used or is traditionally used in literature. That's the, they're, they're slightly different missions. And uh, at the root of it is what Ammon said, which is the, the Webster tradition is a commercial tradition as well. Right, I, I, that, is, that is absolutely true. And also, I mean, that is what Peter said, is that from the very beginning, um, Dean Trench in his, um, on some deficiencies in our dictionary in 1859, a, a, a talk he gave, he, he, he came up with this, that um, one of the main roles that they envisioned for this, what they were calling the New English Dictionary at the time, um, was to be to find the earliest known use of the word. It's one of the, the kind of founding tenets of the, the OED. And they've also had many, many thousands of um, great volunteer readers doing this work for them. It's, it's really sometimes thought of as kind of the first crowdsourced um, intellectual mm -hmm. enterprise. And it's a magnificent, magnificent piece of work. But they, again, they have the leisure of the space and the resources to, uh, to put the stuff there. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I, I can accept all that answer. I think I will look, I do look forward to the day that I can go to the website, see the first known use, click on the date, and then go to your site files and have that uh, tell me what that's what it was. the ideal. That would be the ideal, absolutely. Yeah, and and I and sometimes you do disagree, which is interesting. So especially this is what it especially interests me when the OED has a different date, a later date or an earlier date, um, and, and often, it's. I mean to get granular there, and it's it's funny mm -hmm. because Ammon is one of the great antedators in the English speaking world. We're lucky to have, you know, one, one of the very best working. Uh, and uh, as it happens, I was, a, I was a dater. I was on the dating staff for the 11th Collegiate Dictionary. I was not oh. a definer. Um, and there's a reason for that, uh, but partly because I came late to that project. And so they, put, they added me to the dating. Uh, mm -hmm. But dating in, in uh, 2001 and 2002 uh, was, very different from what it is today because now we have so many more corpora, right. so many more resources. Um, and so I just want to make a quick footnote to Mark's point, which is the difference of the dates sometimes is a really interesting point. It could be a, that we just have more recent research. Uh, it could be, that is, that is maybe frequently Ammon just got there recently and fixed it. Uh, right. Or B, it could be that we simply do not define an obsolete or archaic sense of the word that, that uh -huh. Oxford does. And so uh -huh. you're seeing a different date because we don't even define that meaning of that word. So, I mean, it gets pretty granular once you get deep into uh, the dating. And I love etymological dating. And, and it's like, the last point would be that dating was also the source of our uh, uh, definition order. And this is a really important point that the right. definitions are historical in the Oxford English Dictionary. And that is also true of the Webster tradition in Webster's second, in Webster's third, and in the 11th Collegiate Dictionary. That is something, by the way, all you copy editors have to know, that is something that we are gradually changing online. The online dictionary, which is based on the collegiate, um, as we re review and as we renew and, and, and revise those entries, we are, we are revising them in such a way that, the, uh, that they are not always uh, to be uh, uh, in chronological order because there are times when the uh, oldest sense of the word is very obscure. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we know that most people coming to our dictionary, they want to know what the word means in today's English. And so we're, we're, we're promoting that more logical uh, first sense up to the, to the number one position. And then if you look at the date down below, it'll say uh, 1642 sense three. And then you realize, oh, that's the oldest sense of this word as we give it. Anyway, that's a lot of explanation. I get excited about these things. <laughs> well, as you say, that's important to know because that has been 
and not everybody knows this, but I think a lot of people who are copy editors know that you can't just go by the first definition of a word in Merriam-Webster because there is a chronological. I believe all other dictionaries, I, I know there's some variation, but all other dictionaries will start with the most common definition. Is that true? Uh, I don't know if it's completely true, but and Ammon should speak to this, but I know that, for example, the American Heritage and the Webster's New World, which are two of the very best uh, handmade American dictionaries to compete mm. with the Merriam-Webster Collegiate Dictionary. They were built on a different on a different premise, on a different model. Yeah. And and it, it, my my little my little argument for chronological ordering of of senses is that um, for maybe ten percent of the language, it's really easy to determine which of the two or three senses is the most common. There's a lot of the language for which I'm not myself uh, sure that a, a guy like me sitting at a desk should make that call. Um, yeah. it, it's pretty easy to say that, okay, the word vitriolic or vitriol, as in political vitriol, is more frequently used in the figurative sense than in the literal sense, vitriol meaning hydrochloric acid uh, liquid that burns, which metaphorically means um, words that burn. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure that if you encountered that word today in the Washington Post, it would be referring to the rhetorical sense. That would be sense one. Uh, but that's the newer of the two senses. So it's a, it's a question right. of, and I actually kind of like I think there's a counter argument. If you have it as sense two, then you can you can read the biography of the word as you're reading it down. You can read right. that the literal uh, uh, liquid that burns became the figurative words that burn. I find that to be you know infinitely fascinating. However, that's not the way most people think. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I have. Um, I, I'm going to go to a audience question because there's been one out there for. A while now, and I'm already like, you know, I, I've already got, I've, I've got to remember to ask you how you got into dictionaries because we haven't even, we haven't touched on that yet. But um, uh, and actually, I don't know who's uh, who. I, it's just, I know somebody asked this question uh, about how many American lexicographers, how big the field is. Is yeah, that just a general? See, we, we try to ask people to unmute and ask their own questions, but I don't have a person for this. So I will ask the question, how many uh, lexicographers are there out there? And I think the important part of the question is, do you know them all? Ammon, I, I want you to chime in. I'm going to say very quickly, there, there aren't too many. Um, it, it's one of the very sad truths of, of my time in this business, and by the way, I didn't even know this was a job. So Ammon and I came to this from very different kind of points of view. Um, and uh, when I started, which is say 25 and a half years ago, there were six uh, programs in America. Uh, there was uh, Webster's New World, American Heritage, the New Oxford American Dictionary, uh, Encarta, and the Random House Webster's College Dictionary, um, plus Merriam-Webster. So there were six uh, staffs that were working on what I would say commercial monolingual American English dictionaries. Um, and today there's only one. Uh, and that is a completely joyless fact for me. I think that's a very sad state of affairs. Um, I very much miss our colleagues. And, and, and the only ones I really got to know were at American Heritage, partly because they're in Boston nearby and they, were, mm -hmm. they became friends to me. I didn't really know too many from the other programs. Uh, but anyway, um, as a consequence of this, the small nature of this, I feel like I do know them all, but I may not. But there, I think when you speak of lexicographers in America, I think you have to include, or you could also include academic researchers um, into um, languages that are maybe either, uh, dead languages or, or, or languages that are um, uh, minority languages, uh, indigenous languages, lots of research that is not commercial and monolingual. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ammon? How did... I saw the Ammon step away, so I don't know oh, okay. if uh, it's probably, uh, I don't know. Um, maybe he just got tired of the conversation as many people did and just left. So, as you know, we have, we have a great crowd. We have uh, 65 people I'm showing right now. So, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful Thanks for coming out to hear about this stuff. Um, how did you get into lexicography, Peter? Uh, first of all, I want to emphasize that Ammon's route is about as unusual as yeah. any I've <laughs> ever heard of. There is no nothing like what Ammon did. He essentially read dictionaries uh, to the point of becoming greater uh, a greater expert than than most people who work with dictionaries. Uh, and he is an absolute peer of some of the best scholars 
and some of the best researchers, and yet he's a co uh, really a complete autodidact. I think that's truly a remarkable thing. Um, my my path is much more conventional. I studied a thing. I think I think most of us kind of were hired to do a specific thing. And I for, I don't have a prop, but I was hired to I was hired to write a French dictionary. Um, and I was interviewed. At, I I I was going to be a French professor. I taught at UMass Amherst. Taught French. And I was invited somewhere else to do a doctorate, and um, and then uh, then I, I saw this ad in the paper um, for it was still yeah it was 1994 it was still print, and it was for a translator slash editor of French at Merriam-Webster. Now I had heard of of course I'd heard of the company, so I went for an interview, and I said to them I said don't you already have one? Don't you already have? I mean aren't there already bilingual dictionaries? And they said you know in point of fact we've never done one. We've never done any kind of bilingual dictionary. And so they hired a team to simultaneously uh, create a French-English bilingual bidirectional dictionary and a Spanish-English bi bilingual bidirectional dictionary. They hired native uh, home speakers of both English and French. Um, and uh, we, we were put in the same office uh, and uh, we we were uh, given a few instructions. Uh, of, uh, we, uh, and really, we started by creating a corpus uh, of Spanish and a corpus of French that was at the time entirely of new text uh, written in the 1990s. So it was all, you know, to be modern. In the case of the Spanish, entirely new world Spanish, entirely Western hemisphere Spanish. Uh, to distinguish us from the competition, most bilingual dictionaries are produced by British publishers and have European Spanish. And so we just got to work. So I, I came to this uh, very kind of, it, innocently you know without any kind of knowledge of the field um i just got a job um i have to say also that the, they told me at the time that it, it would take two years to produce this dictionary so i told my grad school i'll be there in two years i was going to take a year off to live in france anyway and they said great um as it as it turned out of course axiomatically all dictionaries take longer uh, it took six years to produce this dictionary. We just marked this month of May as the 20th anniversary of the French dictionary that, that I worked on. And uh, of course, I never went back. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, has it been updated, the French dictionary? I yeah, we, uh, we, we, did a, we did a little update in 2005. Uh, we did an entire second edition of the Spanish, which I'm very proud of, um, just last year. The Spanish, needless to say, has been a much bigger seller than the French, but the French and the Spanish are both category leaders uh, in their field. Um, and so they have earned, they've earned a lot of money for the, for the program, and we we're very proud of it. We've even produced a Spanish language version of the Spanish dictionary, so the, if you buy it in America, it has a preface that teaches the grammar of Spanish in English. And if you buy it in Mexico, it teaches the grammar of English in Spanish. And I think that's kind of fun that we have two versions of the same dictionary in that case. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And also I'm very proud that the French dictionary is an officially recommended text by the province of Quebec, which, uh -huh. and, and it's a real badge of honor for us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have a question. Uh, this one from our friend, Mary Norris. Hello, Mary. Um, if she could unmute and ask away. Hi. Yes, I've been curious about the word cardinal. Maybe I could research this myself, but it's more fun, as we know, to connect with others when we are too lazy to do our own research. So the cardinal was the bird name for the priest, the prelate, or which seems to be the case that the bird was named for the red color that the that father of the church wore. But it doesn't make sense to me because clearly the birds were around before the church had its hierarchy and named guys cardinals. So what did they call cardinals before the church? That is my question. And Ammon, are you still there? Are you still around? Because I, um, I can say right away, boy, that, first of all, what a great question. And it's true that it's interesting that the, the, uh, the Latin word cardinal, card cardinalis, meant serving as a hinge. So hinge is the root word there because uh, the cardinal, let's see, was the, um, was, yeah, that's right. Cardinal he, sins. Yeah, but he, well, yeah, but the, he was the clergyman of mm -hmm. the highest rank next to the Pope and cardinal sins, right? So it, it is true that the, uh, and it, we have a note, it says, uh, from its color resembling that of a cardinal's robes, the crested finch is named for the, for the clergyman. Oh. Not the other way around. And I think that is amazing. And I, to be honest, 
you learn something every day in this job, which is why it's so great to work with words. Uh, and I did not know that that was the order of entry. I'd have to take a quick look at Oxford at, 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 for this to get the real story. This is where a diachronic dictionary comes in handy. And I'll, I'll just key it in. Mm -hmm. I happen to have it open. And um, Meanwhile, I'm happy to know that the bird is also the crested finch. Yeah, and that's an interesting thing that it's uh, um, it's in the same genus as all as uh, it's very close to blue blue jay on the one side and the and the and the chickadee on the other side. Um, There's a uh, bunch of synonyms for the red bird, the Virginia nightingale, a hawfinch, the nutcracker. It's a grosbeak. It's a scarlet grosbeak, and the winter red bird. Who do we thank for that list? Jack Lynch. Uh, Roger Tory Jack Lynch. Peterson. All right, I'm signing off, handing it over. Mary, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Great to see you. Yeah, thank um, you for that question. And I do see, and it's a, there's another in, interesting sort of just, I, I, you know, I can't give a disquisition about this word, but it is one of the unusual Latin-based words in English that predates the Norman Conquest. Most of the Latin-based words we have in English come through French, uh, except for a few words like crucifix, uh, and cardinal now, I know, uh, words that have to do, obviously, with the church. The odd thing about the, the Romans in Britain is that when they backed out and left England, they, did, they took their language with them. They didn't really leave a lot of residue. You'd think that occupying England would leave Latin in place uh, on the Anglo-Saxon population. But in point of fact, the, most of the Latin words that we have in English today are actually uh, Norman French words that derived directly from Latin that came in after the Norman Conquest. This is kind of an interesting demographic factoid. Right, right. And uh, and Mary mentioned Jack Lynch uh, came up with that list. That was um, in the group, group chat. Uh, you probably don't have time to read the group chat, yeah. Peter, but um, there's all sorts of in interesting information that always comes out of the group chat. And we have Jack Lynch uh, with us today. Hello, um, Jack. Who, who is helping out. So that's terrific. Um, and is, Am is Ammon? I do know that Ammon is in yeah. such a rural environment that his internet is sometimes insecure. That, so uh, I'm, not sure if okay. that's, I'm not sure if that's an excuse or a fact. Uh, I'm not, <laughs> yeah. But I do, I do know that, that that is true for him. He's, he's very, very rural and uh, internet can be, can be a little bit spotty. Right, right. Well, that's okay because I, I happen to know having dined with you many times and, and sat at the bar over scotch with you many times that you can talk about all sorts of great things for, for, for a very long time and it's always fascinating and interesting. So, I mean, I mean, when I started doing this, uh, when we first had Mary Norris on weeks ago to uh, kick off this, this, this uh, series, I thought, well, who could I have also, of course, Peter was a, an obvious and immediate um, choice to have somebody to talk to. So, um, so I'm glad you are here. Uh, we, we do have a question about um, spelling bee pronunciation, oh, yeah. um, which is something Now you've done this for the, the, the State Department on behalf of the State Department. Um, yeah. How did that come about? What, 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 how, what does that involve? Uh, you know, let's see, what, what ordered was that? Uh, I tripped into spelling bees so innocently, and I wish, if only I had known, <laughs> if only I had known, <laughs> Um, I was asked in 2008, we had a partnership with a publisher in Korea to uh, uh, make an edition of our uh, Learner's Dictionary, which is one of my favorite dictionaries, one on which I did write definitions. Um, it's, and it's, it's free online, learnersdictionary.com, merriam Webster's Advanced Learner's English Dictionary. Okay. It's the green one. Um, and it's, yeah, it's a book, uh, it's a book I'm very proud of. I love that book. And um, the, uh, the publisher in Korea had licensed from Scripps an official spelling bee. And they, they, they asked Scripps, what dictionary do we use? And Scripps said, oh, you have to use Merriam-Webster. And then they came to us and said, can you send somebody to be our pronouncer? And, um, and John Morse, the president, uh, called me down to his office. He said, how, did, how would you like to you know, go to Seoul and, and be the pronouncer? And I said, you know, how, how hard can this be? You know, what, you know this is... <laughs> So I flew to Seoul um, and I had never pronounced for any kind of spelling bee of any type in my entire life. I had also, to my knowledge or memory, I had never participated in the spelling bee. It just wasn't a thing I did. So I knew less than, um, than I do now. I, I knew less than anybody. 
Um, I will say that this was an ESLB, so the, the, the level of vocabulary was pretty low. Um, uh, that dictionary, if you know, um, has 100,000 words. It doesn't have the very difficult words that you would find in the script spelling bee. So the, the, the language was, was modest. Um, it was more important to have someone speaking clearly um, and knowing, kind of knowing how to put um, the, uh, the, the stress on the correct syllable, you know, that kind of thing. And so I got there and then I realized this would be the most well-documented, you know, three hours of my life. There were something like 200 <laughs> photographers within 20 feet. In, as, you, as you might know, if you know anything about Asian, Asian news events, there, there were just so many photographers, um, there were a couple hundred spellers, and all of their families were behind me. It, it was an incredibly intense event hmm. um, that wore me out, uh, but it was a kind of a thrilling introduction to be thrown into the deep end. So my first B was in 2008. That was an, a scripts B, but it was in Seoul. And uh, then I, I did it again the following year. And then the, the year after that, I went to India for, for the US State Department. And they saw this on my, on my resume or something. And they said, hey, would you do some spelling bees for us? So I did a bunch in India um, for, for, for kids, for junior high level kids. And uh, from there, it slowly grew to, I, I did um, uh, an adult bee in Washington, D.C., and then I did the first congressional bee that, uh, that right. was won by Tim Kaine, by the way, senator from Virginia. Yeah. Um, and it was the Cong there was members of Congress against members of the press. So we had Major Garrett, mm -hmm. Howard Feynman, Karen Tumulty, Kate Nocera, like A-list uh, uh, Washington, D.C. Um, uh, 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 journalists, and then 10 uh, members of Congress, four sitting U.S. senators and six mem uh, uh, Congress uh, members. And so it was, uh, that, and that was at the National Press Club. So and it, anyway, ever since then, I seem to be do, do, doing bees all over the place, including mm -hmm. at Bryant Park in New York City every year for the New York Public Library. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Um, I do know that you do the one for, you have done for several times for the American Copy Editor Society, ACES the Society for Editing. Uh, your reputation. Absolutely the worst one. That's, that's, the, that's the absolute, that's, my yes. least favorite one. <laughs> Uh, because the level, Ooh, is, yes. the level is so high uh, that um, I have uh, that, that that's really the, the one of the most troublesome <laughs> BB uh -huh. uh, because it's really and it was one year you were called we couldn't get a winner we we um, yes I, I'm very, <laughs> I happen to have a very difficult B list on my phone loaded on my phone and we had to go to that list as an emergency backup. Um, and so that was, that's, uh, it was actually kind of fun. And I love the level of competition, but that is without question the highest level adult spelling bee I've ever encountered. Interesting. I, I, and I think that was probably Kate Karp who is, who has won the spelling bee, the, uh, uh, who boo hissed you there, just, uh, just so you know who, who that's coming from. It wasn't me. And I know Kate from the San Diego bee at the, at the public library, which I also pronounced for once. So. <laughs> Oh, I'm, pretty sure she won. I'm pretty sure she won that. She's a terrific speller. No, I, I didn't. I came in third. Okay, but, but I you placed. Yeah, yeah, that was a great one. How to spell um, uh, Duraya. Um, I did have a question, though. Um, I also pronounced for spelling bees, and um, I wrote there that I was really grateful for um, the, um, you know, the explanation of mischievous, which makes me nuts. But um, I also noticed that um, the M-I-N-I -I spelling of minuscule is in the dictionary in MW as um, a pronunciation, but non-standard. Now, if I were to, if you were to give that word in a B, um, minuscule, and somebody gave that spelling, how would you handle that? Uh, well, that, that's a good question. I, it, do, we, do we give it as, is it a stigmatized variant or is it a full variant? Well, I'm looking at it and it said non-standard. Um, okay, so, uh, so that wouldn't, yeah. So if it's, as long as it's, I'm just looking it up now. Yeah. Minuscule. I, yeah. I would stigmatize it. If it's non-standard, then that wouldn't be right. But if, it, if, if it's given as a, for example, uh, it happened in India that uh, I think the word was neighborhood or something. And um, the, the, the young speller used a U in, neighbor, in, in neighborhood. And uh, one of the judges uh, rang the bell, said, no, 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 we're, you know, this is the American dictionary, it's American spelling. And I, oh. I intervened. I said, no, 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 no. That is correct. The speller is correct. In other words, a, a full variant like that, always acceptable. A stigmatized variant, a non-standard variant, we, we would avoid. Right. And, and, I, and I probably don't need to say this to this 
crowd, but minuscule is based on mini, not on minus, um, even though we pronounce it that way. And uh, Mary Norris is waving her hand at me for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, so uh, so the, the M-I-N-U-S spelling is quite common, um, enough to become a variant, but it's really it's still considered non-standard. Uh, it's tough, I think, though, pr pronouncing for bees, I, 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 you know, uh, it's good that um, Kate does it, but all I can say is it, it's, um, it, it, I, I think I've heard a lot of um, uh, sort of horror stories of parents uh, who are disappointed uh, with the way a, a high school bee is conducted. Often, I think uh, a, a pronouncer is chosen maybe uh, as an, an English teacher or a principal or something, and there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think sometimes they think that they, they, they're smart and they know how to do it. And I think you have to always submit to the dictionary and read the phonetics. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why I'm really grateful for judges, people like um, Corey Stamper, who's done this for me, and also Corey Loeffler from Scripps, who's done this mm -hmm. for me. Um, they've both elbowed me in my ribs when I when I said the damn word wrong, um, and uh, because I will, and then I realized, oh, I gave the stress on the second rather than the third syllable, or I've made some small error, and uh, it's so easy to do. And so, I, like I said, for me, there's no ego. The dictionary's right, and I'm wrong. Um, and I think if there's ego involved, which could happen with someone who's not used to doing this, who's not used to uh, working with words so often that you, you, you are, I, I have no trouble recognizing that I'm, that I'm wrong. Um, and there have been times, and you might have, uh, even at the um, Aces B, there have been times when we threw the word out because I said it out loud in the improper way, gave a huge clue to everybody. And then I realized, oh, that's actually the wrong stress. Uh, next word. We'll just throw that out. Go to the next word. It's not about me. It's about making a, a pure experience for the spellers, which is to say mm -hmm. that no advantage is given by hearing uh, maybe a, a, an alternate uh, uh, pronunciation that might tell you what the schwa is. Oh, it's a U mm -hmm. there instead of an E or something. So mm -hmm. I'm very quick to discard a word and start over and recognize that put the blame on me and let's concentrate on the spelling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I think probably at some of those aces bees when it gets toward the end we should just figure out a way to sabotage one or the other. Maybe yeah. we should just be declaring dual winners. But you know, Merrill would just like it to go to the highest bidder uh, because well, it is a fundraiser. As you know, Scripps Scripps had eight winners last year. So <laughs> yes, yes, that was interesting. So uh, so I, I, Heather has been uh, sort of emailing with Ammon, and I'm, um, I think I saw him come back, but I'm not sure if he's back yeah. now. Ah, okay. excellent. We've been yeah. talking all about you. I don't know how much you've heard. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we have yet to talk about, um, you both have, uh, you both have this uh, symbiotic relationship that you're both lexicographers, but you both also are lovers of jazz. Um, and Peter, I know, has his trumpet. When he goes on trips, he has his trumpet with him in his uh, in his hotel room with the with the electronic mute, so he doesn't well, I assume so he doesn't bother the the neighbors. Are you uh, are you still a uh, do you dabble? Do you play? Um, I, I I have given up the saxophone um, a number saxophone. of decades. Oh, excuse ago. me. Um, but uh, I I partly Peter's fault. I I do occasionally play. Uh, I play it sometimes now. I just took it out yesterday oh. from under the bed, and uh, and I do play trumpet um, as oh. well, but not uh, not professionally as Peter does, and and never in a, the company of others. There's an old joke which has many variations, <laughs> which is um, what's the definition of a gentleman? And the most common version I heard is someone who can play the trombone but chooses not to. Um, <laughs> and I think that applies to me in, in the trumpet. Um, but I think that I, I just I, there's a there's a funny kind of backstory here because it's kind of the way I met Ammon, um, and and kind of which took us a, a few a few steps. The first time I ever met him was a, a, an appearance like this, the two of us together, um, in Hartford at uh, at Real Artways, which is a, a, a an art movie theater cafe and lecture space. And Ammon had been there on his book tour. And I got a phone call from them. They said, you know, we loved his dictionary talk and we asked him to come back. And he suggested that uh, we do a little panel with the two of you. Now, I, 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 had, I don't think I'd ever met him. <laughs> I'm not sure. But he knew who I was. 
and I thought that was very generous. And um, the idea was that we, he would talk about Oxford and I would talk about Webster. And when we got there, I couldn't believe that Ammon uh, essentially knew more about the Webster tradition than I did. I couldn't believe how much he knew. And I was so impressed with that. Cut to the next time uh, we met was uh, at a conference in Montreal. And uh, we were talking about going out to dinner as one does at a conference. And I said, well, I'm going to go to a jazz club because that's that, you know, I kind of like jazz and it may not be a good place to hear, you know, to have a conversation. And he said, well, I love jazz. And it turns out that when I was in, uh, in, in school, um, I was at university in Paris. Um, Ammon was literally busking in the subways that I was taking. Um, oh, really? Uh, and it's, so it's entirely possible that I passed Ammon playing tenor saxophone in the subway uh, when I was going to class. Uh, wow. it, and, and so we, our paths crossed in these funny ways. And then subsequently, Ammon has become, has gotten kind of the bug like I have for trumpet playing, which I think has maybe ruined my life in some ways because it becomes an obsession. And, wow. uh, and Ammon is, uh, it, it, I think that's one thing you can say about <laughs> lexicographers is they tend to be obsessives in one way or another. Uh, wow. And if you look around and look at, think of some of the characters, I won't name names, but think of them and you think, ah, yeah, they probably have some obsession of, about something. And I hope it's put into a positive uh, kind of energy. And, and I, think that's, I think that's generally true. Let, let, let me do some uh, some stuff I don't want to forget to do, and that's talk about, so um, Ammon has uh, Reading the OED, which I have pulled out, um, and you have uh, a book called Bad English, and uh, and then, and oh, which uh, which if you can see on gallery view, Aaron, Aaron, say something, so then the, the video will go to you. Hey, check out Ammon's hey. book. <laughs> bad English, great. I, mean, I have a bad English. Uh, so we have bad English, we have reading the OED, and then and then Ammon, you have a book on the uh, the telephone book. What? Yeah. Uh, which which many people don't know what that is anymore. Yeah, it's. Uh, I I somehow convinced my publishers that we should write and publish a book on the the history of the telephone book, and I like to say that this is. Um, of all my books, the one that most fulfilled its early promise, which is to say it sold perhaps dozens, even scores of copies. <laughs> um, it sold about as well as one would expect a social history of the telephone book to sell, which is, you know, it was a self-fulfilling title. Um, <laughs> none of you has, except for uh, Lynn Murphy, who I saw earlier, had a copy. I, I think. I'm sorry, I don't, yeah. Uh, but it's on my list now. And I'm looking for, I'm looking for Peter's, uh, Peter has a chapter. In, uh, I can show you the book. Oh, there oh we please. Go. There we go. We have all three of them. <laughs> I, I love it. Good. And then uh, Peter is a chapter in, uh, this is an excellent, it's a dictionaries of the 19, in the 19th century. If you've been at the, if you've been lucky enough to hear Peter talk about uh, the history, I mean, it's, it's really a fascinating Period, the middle of the 19th century, and the, the dictionary wars, and uh, and the differences of, uh, of viewpoint, and um, and then some of the outrageous things that were done uh, to promote dictionaries. And yeah. Peter's uh, Peter writes about the dictionary of 1868, the first modern dictionary. Um, so, also recommended the whole world in a book. And Thank I think we and I think we have some questions. We did promise that we'd have a, maybe we should do this now. We did promise we'd have a musical interlude uh, because any good talk show has sort of a break and you go to the- um, Ammon's getting his saxophone. Guest. This is gonna be great. Yeah. Good, okay. Well, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna try to play together, are you? No, no maybe that's tricky. a good idea, yeah. but maybe next time. Yeah, I think, I don't, I'd only get to work on Zoom because you would hear yeah. it, everybody on delay and you'd be uh, completely lost. But, uh, and do you have your trumpet? I do, but Ammon, you, you go. Oh, okay. You I love the lighting. Yeah, Oh, <laughs> 
such a rich sound That's i love great. it great love it yeah um peter before you start going okay i just want to say uh careful of the microphone because the trumpet could blow out i don't know uh, uh wave at me if it sounds bad okay yeah So if you want to go into lexicography, the uh, seemingly jazz is uh, maybe not a path to it, but certainly there's got to be some some symbiosis with jazz and, and words. So yeah, there may well be. You know, we I don't know if and and I don't know if there are questions, but of course Ammon's also an expert on usage. Bad English is about usage, and that's another. Yeah. It's funny because. I, I just uh, had this amazing experience. It just ended. I taught a course for the first time in 25 years at Amherst College with Elan right. Stavins um, called The Making of Dictionaries. And what one thing that I discovered is uh, that, you know, you can dive deep into these subjects. And one of the subjects is usage. Uh, we haven't even touched on that. One of the subjects is defining writing definitions uh, and, and then phonetics and there's all these different things. So the fact is you could go on forever about about uh, the technical side of dictionaries, which is which is kind of fun, and everybody has a special kind of a specialization, um, and uh, you know, Ammon is kind of a dating etymol etymology specialist. Um, mine is kind of modern French, uh, and the, the the sort of the Merriam-Webster weird uh, defining tradition that that, that oh, I, I don't mean weird, I mean idiosyncratic. Um, defining tradition, which are two different things, slightly different things. It's weird too. It's okay. And it's weird too. It actually is. <laughs> um, and because and and so uh, you know you you end up being kind of a trivia trap of a certain kind. And what's great about and and I guess it, I know maybe this is toward the end, but it's a nice kind of note to close on, which is that um, everything about Merriam-Webster's teamwork is actually not only just the accumulated work of of the past and our forebears, but the team that's currently working right now, the specialists in the, the bio, biological and, and physical science specialists who wrote the definitions for COVID-19 and uh, coronavirus mm -hmm. words that we just entered in the dictionary a couple weeks ago, they're specialized uh, in writing science definitions. So we, I'm, I'm really thrilled to, to know that I can count on a staff that has so much depth and breadth that they, there, there are specialists in writing certain kinds of definitions, specialists in doing etymology, specialists in doing antedating. Um, and yet what Ammon and I do uh, kind of mostly is a little bit more independent. Um, a lot of what I do is tell our story to the public. Um, and a lot of what Ammon does is of course this ind independent kind of research, but we're plugging into a bigger tradition uh, and a bigger uh, staff. And I, I, that's the point I'd like to make is that it, it is a team effort and there's no way um, anyone could do this alone in the way that they did back in the days of Samuel Johnson and Noah Webster. Right. So in, in terms of usage, it, it's never been sort of the, the bread and butter. Um, there's a, there's a Merriam-Webster usage dictionary that's been, that was produced, here you go, many, many years ago. Uh, but you are doing more with the website. So usage is sort of, um, becoming more of a, so Ammon maybe could tell us what is, uh, what's the use, what is, what's Mary Webster's philosophy in terms of uh, you having usage as, um, as, a, as a product to, 
to share with people? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question, but I mean, I, I would say that people have been trying to figure out how to make usage of product <laughs> so, <laughs> for some time now. There's no obvious way of doing it. Um, but on the other hand, we do know that a tremendous amount of the traffic that we get on our website is people coming looking for specific answers. Um, and unfortunately, we have to come up with a way of telling them there is no specific answer as far as we can tell. So, uh, we, we tend to not have um, so many specific answers that people are looking for. We tend to be, of course, you know, stridently, some say, uh, descriptivist. Um, so what we do is we end up writing a lot of articles about usage. And so um, we have hundreds and hundreds of articles now that will pop up on the uh, specific page. If you're looking for, say, figuratively, um, you will get a, a word of an article. Um, uh, verse literal are um, finalized with um, where we have an article on showing the, the usage history of finally showing that it goes back to 1780 um, rather than be an early 20th century thing that people thought it was and that there's evidence of finalized throughout the entire uh, 19th century as well as the 18th uh, end of the end of 18th century so it's hard for me to say is this uh, a product I mean I guess it's it's making people react more favorably to Miriam Webster we hope as a brand but there's no way that we're, we're not making money, I guess, directly off of usage. We're well, yes and yes and no. And what I would say is that the, these articles, as, as Ammon says, hundreds of articles about usage and history, word histories. Um, what happens is it turns out that the dictionary online not only is more flexible because you have audio and video and you, you can you know, very quickly look things up. Um, it has this extra element, as Ammon points out, you can look up a word and then find an entire 700 word article on the history right. of that usage and that wouldn't be possible in the print dictionary and so that's kind of nice that the the dictionary keeps multiplying in a kind of way um and these articles we we, we write them to be readable you know we write them we try you know we, we we write them in a in a way that is um approachable accessible not excessively scholarly um but with good research behind it so it turns the website into a kind of magazine for word lovers which, uh, which does help with the business, which is to say, if you look up one word, but then click on that article, now we've got two clicks from you, you know, and mm -hmm. that is part of the business too. So in other words, doing good work in this specific way, way about, our, about our language, it, it actually does help with the, um, with the business. Mm -hmm. I, I should, that's very interesting. I should, I should point out uh, that I, it's been pointed out to me that I hyper-corrected earlier with minuscule the two different spellings, I had it opposite. This is the, the bane of a copy editor always thinking about knowing that one is wrong and then uh, not thinking about which is which is correct and which is the, the origin. So I apologize for that. And I also apologize for not getting to more questions, but we, I, if, we if you have a little bit of time, uh, I think we do have at least a couple of questions. One we had about the business sure. that you just alluded to of, um, of uh, dictionaries. Heather, what if we, um, what have we got out there? Yeah, so Mike Pope actually had a question Hi, about the business model. Mike? Okay, here. So, can you hear me? No. Yes. Okay. Um, the question was, you know, in this age of online stuff, what's the, what's the change in the business model for dictionaries? I mean, you used to sell books. That doesn't seem to be the major way for dictionaries in the future. <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. Um, uh, the, uh, th that's a good question. Nice to see you, by the way, Mike, or not see you, but nice. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, no, it's, uh, the website is a big, a big uh, part of our business now, obviously, and we get a lot of traffic. We get a huge amount of, uh, of uh, page views and the page views have uh, advertisements on them so that we get revenue from the advertising on the website and on the app. And we still, by the way, we sell a lot of books and books are still very profitable. So it's not sort of a sudden shift, but it's kind of also, we, we, we are a publisher that used to be primarily a print pub publisher. And, uh, and now we are both a print publisher and an online publisher. And that online publishing model is one that didn't even exist when we went online in 1996. There were no ads. Um, 
but uh, now there is an advertising kind of marketplace that that uh, that supports us and it does pay our salaries so that uh, I'm grateful for it in other words please use the product uh, please please come and use it okay uh, other questions Heather out there we had a couple others. I didn't know if Jonathan wanted to expand on his at all. Jonathan. Uh, sure. Um, uh, Peter, I think you talked about how um, the, the definitions are being moved from chronological order to use order. And that's kind of slowly being rolled out. Um, is there any, any indication when you go to an entry whether it has been changed or it is mm -hmm. still in chronological order or do you just have to kind of infer that from the definitions? Yeah, uh, nice to see you. I, I like your, <laughs> nice to see your, uh, your, your corridor. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Jonathan, thank you. And, uh, no, you know, I wish we, I wish we did what Oxford does, uh, which is to give a date of the, of the last update, kind of like right up on the corner. We don't quite do that. However, there is a trick for people like you who are heavy users, which is when you go down to the bottom to the etymology and you see the, the date and it says 1564, if it in parentheses says since four or since three or since two, anything other than mm -hmm. since one, then you know that one has been reordered and that one has been revised. Um, and if it says sense one, which most of them still do, then you don't have a full sense of whether or not that has been completely revised or not. Um, but if you see any entry that says anything other than sense one for the date, then that is a, that is a total clue that, um, that entry has been reordered and revised. Great. Thanks. And we had a question about, uh, for Ammon about the process of reading a dictionary, Heather? Yes, Douglas wanted to know about reading the dictionary. Douglas, do you want to unmute? It looks like he might not still be here, so I'll ask on oh. behalf. Uh, he wanted to know, do you read a dictionary in brief stints or in day-long indulgences? How does one read a dictionary? Any way you feel like. I mean, I've done it both ways. <laughs> Um, and uh, I think each has its pleasures um, and uh, its benefits, but um, I, I think that now I tend to read them page by page and not day long because I'm busy doing other things. But um, I, one of the things that I love about lexicography, about being, being affiliated with dictionaries is the, the constancy with which I, I, I learn things. I always am learning things. Um, and it's um, it's an it's an unceasing amount of kind of source of joy. I mean, it could be something as 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 Peter mentioned earlier the the earlier use of vitriol. Um, I came across that just a few weeks ago, and I had never known of it as in this earlier sense. And it, it gives the language so much more of a richness, knowing that at least some dictionaries, for instance, define supercilious as the uh, coming from supercilium, the eyebrow perhaps the raised eyebrow, which is, I think, kind of a disputed etymology, but um, it just makes me think of, of, of language in a kind of new way. And these aren't useful, per se. It's what I love about getting deep into the nuts and bolts of the dictionaries. You learn these things that are incredibly useful, I mean, incredibly unuseful, but still make the language feel like it's coming alive. It gives us this wonderful texture. And you can get that from five minutes of the dictionary. Terrific. I think we have at least one more question. I know we're we're over time. I don't even know what time it is. I don't really pay attention, but oh, there's quite a bit. But at least one more question. Yes, Patty wanted to know about announcing changes. Patty. Hi guys. Um, yeah, I think people have asked. Can you hear me? I yep. have a, mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. These are cheap. Um, I think people might have asked you this before, but is there any way to alert us people who use a dictionary so often about these changes? Like, for example, I've been going around adding a hyphen into goodbye just because I knew that was the first <laughs> listed. And then last week I thought, I'm going to look that up. I'm just, and sure enough, it's one word now. Um, I was thinking about maybe a sign up where we could sign up with an email for notifications. Is there anything, any plans or something like that? You know, it's a good idea. Um, that's, you know, that, that it's, a, it's a good idea. I mean, these things happen 
Uh, they tend to happen at the same moment as it, it, whenever we announce new words, which is maybe three times a year. We just did a couple weeks ago. Um, and we're going to publicize maybe 20 of them. But that means there may be another 300 or more that we're not talking about. It, it could be as many as a thousand, you know, it depends on the, the release. And it could be, and it's always in those moments that we make the changes. We make them all at once. And so that's usually when you'll see things as simple as a, a compound shift. And the fact is, we, we're not going to, that's not going to be in the marketing copy. We're not going to announce that we, you know, uh, changed the hyphen and, and uh, good, goodbye. Uh, because it really only affects, you know, word nerds like us. Um, and uh, so that I've, the first point I would make is that um, check if, if there's a word whose styling you're watching, that check it at that moment. Um, and then you'll see, ah, they just made a switch. But otherwise, I, I will take that down. And I, I mean, it's, I, it is a good idea. I think I have heard this idea before. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that is something we could do um, in, terms of, in terms of styling. We, you know, the other side of the coin is because of the competition we used to, that we, we used to have especially, we never release all of the changes. Um, you know, we just simply don't want everyone to know, uh, you know, all of the work we're doing. Some of them are corrections and that, we're, that, that we've improved the entry so much, we don't want to draw attention to where it was, for example. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, and there could be very good reasons, could be very banal reasons. It might be a, just a simple typo and we've fixed it and, you know, you know, the only a few people noticed. So uh, there's a lot of reasons why we don't an announce everything. However, there could be a happy medium of professionally interesting changes um, that might be good for you and, and not for the general release. And so I will, I'll, I'll make that suggestion. Okay, one one last question uh, from me, and I and I'm curious about this. You both must know an awful lot of words, uh, and Ammon in particular, uh, being a dictionary reader, I, I I have to wonder what's it like in a at a cocktail party. Uh, do you deliberately pull out? I, I mean, I don't think you would. I shouldn't say deliberately. You wouldn't do this deliberately to um, to impress, I'm sure. But do you sometimes find yourself pulling out a word that nobody in the room knows and, you, and just stares at you, uh, wondering if you're speaking a foreign language? Um, I, I find that I am I am able to alienate cocktail party guests without resorting <laughs> to large words. Um, so I, I I don't think I've ever had to dip into that particular quiver. Um, I, I I try not to. Um, <laughs> not just because I alienated them well before I get the opportunity to do that, but um, that um, again, I, I, I tend to think that, that words that are, are, are obscure or are, are, are little used, they should be enjoyed for their own sake, not for the, the sake of, um, of obscurity. So, mm -hmm. so uh, there, there was a, uh, a question that we, that we put on Twitter that I should um, ask about at least in terms of big words. Uh, there are three words, and I know one of them, um, quacksalver, sarcastic, panglossian. These are all three words that have uh, something in common. Ammon must know. No, <laughs> they, they, they've all trended. In it's a trick question, yes. They've all been trend watches that we've written, right? Yeah, and th that's, a, that's a neat thing to, 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 to maybe end on and talk about, which is we work on writing dictionaries and editing them and being careful about them. But Ammon and I, particularly as kind of a, a small team, work on the other way, which is which words people are looking up. You know, what, what words are people looking up in real time? And uh, Ammon and I are often the people who write those little articles uh, we call Trend Watch. If you go to the homepage, there's something called Trend Watch. And that is just ceaselessly fascinating to me um, and has been since, um, since I got involved with the online dictionary. So that, which is going back to about 2002 for me, looking at this data, um, looking at the words that were looked up after 9-11 and after... Uh, you know, of, of significant events, whether it's the presidential election or the Oscar ceremonies um, or, a, you know, a movie release, or in this case, with, without question, an enormous event like the coronavirus um, and seeing what words uh, sent people to the dictionary. I mean, I just think it's an interesting data point, for example, that we had a spike on the word 
pandemic in, on February 24th. Uh, so that means the United, the American population was sufficiently interested in this word to spike our data on the 24th of February. And then you might want to consider when were governmental reactions taking place. But we knew that the public was paying attention on this date. Uh, mm -hmm. And we have this proof. And I think that's just, as I said, ceaselessly interesting. Right. One of the things that I thought was, was particularly fascinating that happened recently was um, the other day we saw the word Mara, M-A-R-A, -A, spike. And it was, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a not particularly well-known South American rodent. Um, and <laughs> it was unclear why this would spike. And then we found out that what it was, was it, the plural form of Mara is Maras, M-A-R-A-S. And it was what people were looking up in response to uh, Mario Cuomo ostensibly quoting Judge Learned Hand, uh, stone by stone across the morass, M-O-R-A-S-S. -S. And <laughs> people were sufficiently ill-acquainted with the word morass that they just misspelled it as M-A-R-A-S and were given the plural form of this obscure South American rodent. Oh. Um, and nobody was actually interested in that, but they came across it through their own orthographic problems. So it, um, our cool. data, our data went one way, and people's curiosity was actually going somewhere else. This is a great yeah. uh, situation where the phonetic spelling of the word brought you to the wrong word. Right, which which is some people complain about the online dictionary that you can't flip through and have those moments of serendipity uh, where you you learn another word. You see, you learn six words on the way to the one you're trying to to look up. Absolutely. And that's the so thing I, I miss the most about, about the online dictionary. That is the one thing that you just simply can't replace. What's your favorite non Merriam Webster dictionary? Ammon? Oh, <laughs> are you are you asking me? You asking I'm asking you both. I, 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 uh, for, I, for me as a working as a as kind of a working uh, stiff, uh, it would be the Petit Robert. <laughs> in, in, um, in France, uh, because that's it, my it, third choice. Yeah. yeah, it is really the equivalent to our collegiate dictionary, and I get what I okay. need out of that. Out of that, it's really, really um, Alain Rey, who's still alive, um, is the original uh, editor. He's in, I think, he's in his nineties, um, and he's kind of a public mm -hmm. figure in France. And I love watching him on YouTube and listening to his interviews. Uh, but he did a wonderful job. He's a, he's a great crusader for for uh, real descriptive lexicography. Um, and his staff, I've had lunch with them. I've met them. They've given me a tour in Paris. It's been very uh, uh, congenial as a relationship. They just went online with their dictionary. But that's, that's, that's my go-to second uh, dictionary. All right. That's a safe, if anybody, safe choice. If anybody has a, 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 a couple of hours and wants to read a great dictionary, I, I always recommend um, Henry, Cockton's, Henry Cockton's 1623, which you can find online for free. Um, and it's, it's lovely because it has absolutely no utility whatsoever. It's full of insane words, many of which I think he must have made up because there's <laughs> catalate, to lick dishes, or desticate, to cry like a rat, um, debacate, to revile after the manner of a drunkard. A lot of these words don't come up anywhere else. I mean, and what's even greater is that none of the other lexicographers even bother trying to steal his stuff the way that, say, Phillips did with Bullock or Blount in the 1650s. Um, they're just totally absurd, but they're really quite fun. Um, so there are only a couple of thousand of them. And um, I, I would say that's my favorite kind of reading dictionary. But aside of that, for practical uses, it's, of course, the OED. Yeah. OK. Tell us again what the dictionary was. Uh, 1620, uh, it was published in 1623. It's uh, uh, Henry Cockrum's Dictionary, D-I-C-T-I-O-N-A-R-I-E. Okay. Um, it's just usually called Dictionary of 1623. All right, and if everybody sticks around, we'll get the, the link for that in the group chat so uh, everybody can spend the rest of the evening uh, enjoying that dictionary. Right, one more question, are you reading anything yeah. now that's a, uh, like a dictionary or a phone book? Is there something else on your list? Me, no. Yeah. I, I, I have gardening books now, so. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both very much. And I do apologize for going over. I knew I would, and I should have uh, probably done more to, to keep myself uh, under control and in with, within an hour. But um, thank you all for sticking around. And thanks to our guests very much. And uh, oh, and we have, uh, and I haven't queued it up yet, but we have, uh, I've forgotten to do that one task. 
but I'm going to queue up our music and that will announce who our guest is next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank and you. nice to see you, Anna. Nice to see all of you. Thank you, Heather, Patty, Meryl, Mary, Jack, <laughs> um, Jonathan. So many friends that I see. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you.